As you can see from uh, Simon's wonderful introduction, I have gone through many years of education. I started my career uh, in a research position, move into an engineer, and then move into engineering management, and, and have come quite a long way. So what I'd like to speak about is you know, what I have been doing in my professional life about finding my career North Star and how I ended up being where I am today. So, you know, in the previous session, we heard about some amazing uh, points and some amazing success factors that we all as Asian Americans need to be very aware of. And this is also the first lesson I've learned when I came to the U.S. as a young graduate student. And this is really about finding my voice and also making sure my voice is heard. So as you can see from my resume, I've gone to school. I've gone to school pretty much until there's no more school I can go to. <laughs> so this is probably a very similar story to many of you sitting in the audience. So my parents, if you look at their living room, the most visible pictures on the wall is my graduation picture from Tsinghua University and also my brother's graduation picture from Tsinghua University. So in the culture we grew up in, you know, receiving the best possible education seemed to be the epic, the pivot that we need to reach in our entire life. And little do we think about, that's really just the beginning. It's really not about education, it's about what we do with the education. So I came to America for more school. And when I you know, first started in the US classroom, I find something that I'm very positive with. You know, I have been a good student, so I work hard, you know, I study the textbooks, I listen to the professors. And what I've noticed about my fellow American students is they like to interrupt and they like to ask really stupid questions in the classroom. And sometimes I wonder, you know, why are you insulting all of us and the professor by asking something the professor has just explained several minutes ago? So this is something I couldn't understand until it finally dawned on me. Being able to ask meaningful questions, being able to engage in a meaningful conversation, being able to show your interest in the subject that's being taught by the professor or is being discussed in the classroom, that's really a very important quality that is being valued in the professional, in the professional world of America. So certainly finding your voice is not just about asking questions. Actually asking questions, what I've learned, is the easiest way to find a voice. Because sometimes you may not always have a point of view, <coughs> but I can guarantee everybody have a question in their mind. So, so in China, you know, we grew up in a very, very different way. Um, I really like one of the analogies someone used in describing the environment that we grew up in. So I was in a female um, uh, setting. People told me, you know, you have the syndrome of being the princess syndrome. So what is the princess syndrome? The princess syndrome is about, you know, the princess stays in the castle, spends all her life's energy on making herself looking really, really good. And the point of making herself looking really good is hoping one day the prince would come by the castle and rescue her and they get, you know, happily ever after after that. So the princess syndrome is quite a reflection of how we grew up. You know, we are taught to learn, get the best education, do the best quality of work, being always the hardest worker of the group. And hopefully, you get noticed by your manager, by your superior, and you get promotion. You know, in China, we have this phrase of, you know, our chest is full of talent, but we never get recognized in Huai Cai Bu Yu. That's a perfect reflection of the princess syndrome. So, this has a profound effect on me. And what I've learned, you know, comparing the Chinese or the Asian type of corporate culture versus the American corporate culture, you know, I sum it up that you need three things to be successful. So there is competence, there is results. That is universal in all of the corporate expectation or in all of the success, that success criteria that we're being evaluated on. 
competence and results. But there is one last factor that is very different. You know, in the Asian culture, we need to be a good follower, a big rule follower. You know, we need to follow our leader. In the American culture, being critical thinking, being able to lead, being have, able to have your own point of view and your own voice is far more important. So as we focus on competence and results, what I've learned that making this transition from China to the US, the biggest difference that I could make is to have my own voice and being willing to have it heard. So, and I watched my kids. You know, my kids were born in Silicon Valley. We went back to China for a few years and they came back again. And they seem to have exactly, you know, the little Yan Bing I see is growing up right in front of me. You know, my daughter is growing up in Silicon Valley, just like a lot of kids here. You know, they're, they love science, they love computer, they, they seem to be doing really, really well uh, in their school. And they seem to have, you know, strong ambition. But they are very quiet, and they don't like to, uh, they don't like to speak. And so, so I see my girls, actually, uh, I have two girls, one of them you know, wants to be a video game designer. You know, she, she really enjoys video game playing, but also designing. My other girl actually wants to be a tech company CEO. You, know, you can see she's fairly ambitious, but she asked me this question. You know, Mom, you go on speech all the time. Can I be a tech company CEO without ever having to speak? <laughs> and, and I had to really crush her assertion right there. Unfortunately, you know, being able to speak, being able to be a strong and confident communicator is really the essence of how corporate America is, you know, is valuing success. So, so this is the same point you know, that is emphasized you know, um, in the previous session we've heard. But I'm personally living through this transition. And if you're listening to me speaking, I'm appearing to be very comfortable, very confident you know, as I speak here. I came from exactly the same route where my daughter came through. And I remember when I was a little girl just like her, when I was even in high school, you know, my relative would tell me, you know, Yan Bing, you really have a big virtue in you. And what is that big virtue? Is you're quiet. Because I can go to a big, you know, family banquet with, you know, all the relatives that gathering without saying a single word. So that was actually considered a virtue by my, by my relatives. So as we learn the importance of communication and having a voice, I, I do think myself, and I'm looking at my, my kids growing up, you know, we're a perfect example of that when you know the importance of communication. When you put it as part of your professional priority, you know, we can all learn how to become a much more effective communicator. So my first aspect is really about you know, finding your unique voice and making sure it is heard. So let me switch here to my second topic. This is about finding your career North Star. So there are so many different ways when you hear about a career planning session, that different ways to describe how you should plan your career. So hopefully we hear about, hey, why don't you think about how you plan your career ladder? What we've learned is your career is never a ladder. You just keep going up because it can go in many, many different directions. And very few people have the opportunity or the fortune to just keep going up a straight ladder without ever falling or without missing a step. You know, there has been discussions about you know, how you build a career in a shape like a pyramid. You know, you build a lot of foundation skills and you keep becoming better and better and you keep going up until you reach the very top of the pyramid. Where Sheryl Sandberg put it as, you need to think about your career as a jungle gym. So it's really, there is no rule here. You have to be able to navigate and go left and right and up and down and compete in a very uh, non-conventional fashion. So what I have learned from my personal journey is really about defining a career North Star. So what does that mean? So again, coming back to our Asian heritage, I felt most of my part, uh, most of my life, I grew up in the autopilot mode. 
You know, I know driverless car and autopiloting is all the rage in driving. Uh, but I do think autopiloting from a career and professional development point of view is suicidal. So I was uh, in the autopilot mode. You know, as we go to good school, you know, if you're really good at school, you just go to many, many more schools. So, so we go to school. And we rarely think about what we want to do with it. And if you are good at math and science, you become an engineer and you stay as an engineer. Rarely we think about what we really are, who we really are, what we really want. So this happened to me uh, recently. You know, when I, turned, when I turned 40. So this dawned on me that I have been largely growing in an autopiloted mode for my career. So I never really thought about what my end goal is and what I want to make myself look like. So when I turned 40, I really started to think about very, very hard. You know, some of you may be thinking, hey, is that an early onset midlife crisis? You start to get into all these philosophical thinking about who you want to become. You know, or maybe the Chinese way of, you know, when we turn 40, we don't become confused anymore. This is like, this is sure before. But it really happened to me literally when I turned 40. So, you know, I look at myself, what I enjoy. Yes, I have a deep engineering rooted background. And I've been good being an engineer and being an engineering manager. But what do I enjoy the most? What I found out, what I enjoy the most is leading large organizations, leading large groups of people to look at some impossibly uh, difficult goals and leading transformation and leading business transformation and trying to create something of impact. So, so I really think that is my true calling. So when I turned 40, I decided, okay, what is the best way to do that? Is to run a large business and is to become a CEO. So that seemed to be a very hearty uh, goal at the time and why that was the case because I was still fairly junior in my professional development. You know, I was a senior manager and I just got promoted into director around the time I turned 40. Uh, but with this goal in mind, you know, for the next few years, I worked really hard to strategize. Strategize what skills I need to learn and what roles I need to play and what type of relationship and mentorship and support I need to get. So, and it is very powerful for me. Um, I have been, at certain junctures, being offered opportunities to do something that is very interesting. At one point, um, at VMware, you know, we have this amazing role of leading our global workforce transformation, uh, working very directly with our CEO and our CFO, you know, all the senior leaders in the company. And this seems to be a big jump from where I was doing but I turn it down. I turn it down because I wanted to gain much more deeper experience in running a business unit, running a product organization. So I remember even having a conversation with our CEO, uh, Pat Gelsinger, you know, who is a longtime um, Intel veteran. You know, he gave me a very clear answer. You know, the end thing you know where you're wanting to go. And therefore, the decision is very simple is to stay on the product path. So having a clear North Star not only gives me clarity, it gives all the people around me an incredible levels of clarity. So this has helped me tremendously. And if we look at all of us in, in this room, you know, so starting from our graduation from college until retirement, we easily have 40 years of spend in our career. And clearly, um, Dr. Ku was able to do it much longer than 40 years. So, so this is my personal story in the past five years. In five years is really a very short, insignificant period of time, thinking about our career spending in a 40-year life uh, career span. And so what can happen in that 40 years if we make it much, much more meaningful, much, much more convicted of the goal you want to go. Coming back to the, uh, the analogy of driving and autopiloting. So when we drive, 
you know, yes, with all the great help of GPS and all that, you know, rarely we would be driving without entering a destination. But too often, I see people entering the career without ever thinking about where they want to go. So even though this seems to be a very simple question, if I just ask many of you in the audience today, what is your career North Star? I bet most of you will seem to be very puzzled because this is not something we tend to think about a lot. You know, in driving, we think about the destination, we think about the route, and we think about what experience and sites we're going to see along the road. A very similar analogy is happening for our career. So think about your career North Star, and that's something that definitely has helped me tremendously. So, what I'm going to say on this last topic. So this is actually the topic about you know, finding ourselves and finding who we are, and also how we can be an authentic leader, an authentic person. So looking at this picture, you know, this picture is from uh, Peking Opera. You know, what is the importance of these two pictures? The picture on the left is an oil painting that's hanging in my dining room. So this is the character, um, a very feminine uh, character in Peking Opera. And the picture on the right uh, is Mu Huiying, the, um, the, the famous uh, female heroine in Chinese history. So not only she's beautiful, as all the stereotypes for women uh, requires, you know, she's very powerful, and she's an admirer for a huge number of soldiers and, and defended the country against the foreign invasion. So, Peking Opera is the best way to describe, you know, sometimes how much stereotype come into place. Because as beautiful as, you know, historical this art form is, there is a, also a very distinct way of, you know, you look at the color of the people's costume, the style of the people's costume, the type of makeup or face paint they put on their face, you can know exactly what this person's profession is. Is this person rich or poor? Is this person good or bad? So, so really, everything about your appearance defines who you are. And certainly, there are all these Asian American stereotypes. You know, for being female, there are also a lot of you know, stereotypes. You know, when you become a mother, people naturally assume you're no longer committed to, to your work. You know, when we are Asian, we naturally assume we must be a really good engineer and like to follow the rules. And all these stereotypes against us, they're unconscious, but they're incredibly strong biases that sometimes limit what we can do and limit what we can accomplish. So recently I was being biased as being too young, which is actually a bias I like. You know, I was <laughs> walking in to meet with CEO of a very famed semiconductor company who, uh, who happens to be Chinese American as well, and not on the pioneer list, but almost ready to be on one of the, the, the Silicon Valley pioneers. And I walk in to have this meeting with, with the CEO, and he passed by the conference room without entering. And I find that to be quite puzzled. He later <coughs> said uh, to me, oh, Yan Bing, I assume you're Yan Bing's assistant. So, so we get <laughs> stereotype all the time. And it's unintentional, it's unconscious, it's not with bad intention, but this is how ingrained you know, stereotyping and all these unconscious biases are in, in our society and in the, uh, in the workplace. So how do we react to that? The way we react to biases is by covering. A lot of the time, the way we react, say, hey, if I don't want to be viewed as a weak leader, you know, maybe I need to appear as less feminine. You know, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who's you know, one of the greatest leader, female leader, you know, in uh, modern history. She even went through voice training to make her voice sounding much lower, much men-like. So people really go into great strength to cover up who they really are. You know, Asian, we tend to think about, hey, we come to America, we need to be more westernized. 
you know, we need to be assimilated. So those are the ways, maybe those are the ways to success. The good news is there has been a lot of recent research and there has been a lot of real examples where it shows assimilation is not the path to success. Assimilation is not the path to leadership. Authenticity, on the other hand, is the path to success and is the path to leadership. So I um, recently read a lot of research by a Japanese American scholar called uh, 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 Kenji Yoshiro. So he's a Yale scholar specialized in law, and he's Japanese American. He also is, is gay. So he did a lot of amazing research about how uncovering and authenticity now is really important for us to become who we are and to become truly successful in a professional world. And I see this play out in many of the examples around me. You know, when I was a graduate student at Princeton, I had a very famed professor, uh, Wayne Wolf. So he became a IEEE fellow probably shortly after he became 30 years old. So he's very well established in VLSI design, and, you know, um, um, so in his professional field. And he was a good supporter of me. So I think we had a um, productive relationship. So I was able to graduate in three years uh, under you know, his supervision. So, so I think we had a productive relationship. But what I felt was always missing is I never had a real personal relationship with my first professor. Despite I have the same levels of, very high levels of respect for him, and despite that, the fact that he actually has good recognition of my PhD work and let me graduate very quickly. So it took many, many more years for me to understand why. So this is when I got an email from someone called Meredith Wolf. This is when I learned my professor actually had gone through gender reassignment and became a she. And this is when you know, I'm no longer seeing my professor on a daily or regular basis and we're living on opposite coast in the country. But when Meredith discovered who she really was, you know, she really came alive. We actually became much more closer in our personal relationship, in our connection. So this is a real example when someone, rather than covering up who they really are, uncovering in a powerful, powerful story. You know, my uh, predecessor in my role at VMR uh, is also a Chinese American. Uh, called Charles Pan, and I think some of you um, have uh, seen his uh, um, presentations in a forum like this before. So if you get to know Charles, Charles is, was a senior VP, was a general manager, a highly successful executive um, at a company that is, is a fully American company, and yet he's more Chinese than anyone I've seen. He really is like a Chinese college kid because he likes to play ping pong, or any of um, uh, he orders Chinese food for any of our off-site uh, uh, events, even though we have a large, far larger percentage of non-Chinese in our organization. So, so he, and most importantly, you know, he really is just like a, a college kid. You know, his hair kind of looks like out of place you know, when he comes to work, not like a typical senior vice president in the company. But yet, he was very powerful, very successful, because being the authentic himself, he was able to build a connection with the people around him and get the level of respect he gets. And I was listening to one of um, our executives uh, in the company, and this person made a comment saying, I'm willing to work for Charles at any given time. And this is a, a person who is far more senior than Charles in, in, the, in the company rank. And yet, he was able to say this. So what does authentic, uh, authenticity help? How, how does it help us? You know, first of all, it's really, really difficult to fake who we really are. It's really not sustainable. You may be able to do it once or twice, but you can't really do it over a long period of time. So that makes you a very tired and very unhappy person. So 
you know, covering is not really a sustainable activity. And authenticity is also much, much more powerful. Because when we are authentic leader, we don't lead just by giving orders. You know, we lead by giving our heart. So this is where authenticity comes from. We're able to connect with people in a much, much more powerful way. And authenticity also let people believe you're confident. Because you're comfortable in your own skin, and you're willing to show up as who you are. So I find it very rewarding when sometimes I get to call, be called as an authentic leader. Because when I hear that, I feel that is the highest levels of recognition I can receive for my style of, uh, of leadership. So, so we've talked about three topics that I've learned and I find it very personal to my heart and also personal to where I am today. So we talk about finding the voice and we talk about how you find your voice and also make sure it's heard. You know, we talk about finding your North Star. So think about what that North Star looks like, feels like for you today. We talk about authenticity is the way to success. Authenticity is a way to leadership. And nothing help being, making you be an authentic person by sharing your story. So think about how you can demonstrate authenticity by telling you, telling, telling the stories of yourself and who you really are. It's been a huge honor to speak to all of you, and I really look forward to the interaction that we have at the panel time. Thank you very much.